Um, for people interested in the white elephant of the company store, check check with Howard, but right here. And one of those days. Anyway, yeah, check with Howard. Check with Howard. He has the chits, and he can get you chits. Uh, and we'll give you a whole pile of chits. <laughs> So um, anyway, couldn't couldn't resist on that. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn this over to Mark, and you can come on up here, Mark. It's a, we don't. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out where the it, these might help. Uh, There, got it. Oh, yeah, this is, well, the, yeah, you know what that view is. Yep. All right. See all that okay? All right, I I didn't, I was, had my back turned to Tom's question, but how many, show of hands, how many have moved a layout? How many have torn them down and thrown them in a dumpster? Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, anyway. Well, thanks for uh, having me here. I have moved a lot of layouts, so I will get through this. And Joe Sullivan asked me a while back, and uh, I noticed he's not here, so uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, he's tearing a layout down. Exactly. Anyway, well, I'm Mark Bridgewater. So I wanted to run over the topics tonight. So we all know layouts are never finished. So I have a few ideas of why that is. A little bit about me. I'm a master layout mover. That's the MLM distinction. Um, the journey of my five Feather River route layouts that covers almost 30 years, which is amazing to me. Um, what have I learned? What would I recommend? And what's next for me? Layouts are never finished. <clears throat> so the pace, I think, is limited by the time and the cost, family obligations, health, change, you change your mind. Um, what I've noticed is that increasing skill level, you start to go back and try to change things. And at some point, you're like, you know what, I'm going to start over. Um, other layouts on the tours, uh, you started out not doing operations, but then you really like operations, so you have to kind of try to retrofit it. You do burnout of the same layout, and I think CAD track planning is also, you know, it's great, but then people get really consumed and they get down to the nth degree, and I can assure you, you don't need that much detail. When you start building, you're going to make a bunch of changes anyway. So, me, I am actually English, Chris. Um, Born in Birmingham, came over when I was four. My mom said she used to take me to the train station in the stroller, so I think I've always uh, loved trains. Been married 39 years. My son lives in Marietta. He's married, and my daughter's going to Duke for her PhD. I've been in N-Scale since I bought the first little Atlas setup in 1972. My father said it's just a passing fancy, so ha. Um, I own, own new rail models. Um, and sold it to ProtoPower. So if anybody has our blue points or cup holders or throttle holders, we, we did all that years ago back in uh, Washington. So I started out um, in the San Francisco Bay Area after college, and then we moved from there up to the Pacific Northwest around Seattle. Within Seattle, I moved twice, and then I moved to Atlanta. So that's where the story begins on moving layouts. Looking back at the milestones, my brother and I built a layout as teenagers until the three H's came along. And if you don't know what those are, see me after the talk. Um, I did have a track circling my room at college. It did not attract any more women than, than I would have liked. Um, I had a small N scale and HO layout in our, my, bought my very first house at a, like a half unfinished basement, which told me that when I build something, I'm not going to go into unfinished basements. So um, 
did build a house. I had room for HO, and then our son came along, and evidently he needed a bedroom. So, you know, I've never forgiven him for that. So, um, but what happened is I went over, anybody heard of Jim Providenza? Yeah, probably. So I went over to his house and blown away by a, a double deck operating layout. I literally came back and cut up this layout that I was you know, starting on and I show you some pictures. And then um, after we moved uh, into Seattle, my wife got recruited by Microsoft, and, sorry, in San Francisco, and my wife got recruited by Microsoft. So I have the distinction of having Bill Gates pay for moving my layout. Yeah, he's got the money, right? Um, we, we were pretty involved in the start of this magazine um, years ago. I wrote a lot of articles. Those are some cover shots. Um, my mom bought all the issues, so it sold pretty well. All right, so down to, um, I think there are three major parts of a move. You've got the initial assembly of the layout, you have to disassemble it, and then you have to reassemble it. You need all three. You can't just sort of think about it later. And so each of those stages really requires that you figure out the bench work, the track, the electrical, plan all that out to be moved. You need a crew to help you, and you need some kind of logistics plan that's going to move the layout. A lot of things that you wouldn't normally do if you just start building a layout. So starting off with the initial assembly, design it to be moved. It's gonna be moved. Even if you don't move it, when you're gone, someone's gotta move it. So uh, keep that in mind for those that come behind you. The, the uniform modules are, I swear by them because you, you build them so that they can be removed. It's fast, get them out of doors, down the stairs, et cetera. You don't have these weird shaped ones like I did on the very first layout. Um, consider weight when you're building them, you know, if you do have to move them. Uh, try to get the joints where the tracks just have a single track across that joint, not under ladders and stuff like that. Mark the, the wiring. And I didn't say I did all these things. This is what I suggest you do. <laughs> um, and then uh, try, try different things. I do have sub panels, which I think helps a lot. And then the shell scenery, just the cardboard webbing, I found I could kind of press that down when I try to reconnect them and uh, flow the, the scenery. And then don't glue the bench work. You really can disassemble it and use it for the next layout. Save you, save you a bunch of money. Um, the disassembly. So you're gonna mark each module. You're gonna create a spreadsheet with all the dimensions. And I have some pictures of what I did. Uh, get the help from friends because they're, they're bulky modules. I use a multi-tool, cuts the scenery really cleanly without um, a lot of dust. And they can't? No. <laughs> they can hear you. Okay, for all the online people, we're going to try to work on it. When you say, no, you don't have to start over. Yeah. <laughs> change, change the ending. We think the people online should be able to see it. Uh, go ahead and continue and we'll, we'll check. Are they? Yeah, but they're on, they see it now, as far as you know. Was that a thumbs up from somebody? Yep, okay. All right, uh, so basically mark everything and think in terms of, um, are your batteries low?
Maybe it's me, but, but my battery's low. Your battery's low. Yeah, it's late. What, what said battery's low? It came up and said, here, you plugged in. Is that switch hot? It's the own slash box. <laughs> Okay, so where I was was this the cutting tool. You'll find the right tool that doesn't destroy your layout when you're trying to <clears throat> take it apart. Um, I cut all the bus wires and replace them when I get the new layout. You keep the sections, cut them at each module, and then the feeders are still connected, and then you run a, a new wire by and just connect that section to the new wire. So little things like that that I've learned along the way. Um, label everything you can. You will be amazed at what you don't remember when you get to the new place. And a lot of times, um, like I'll show you, I reassembled all the pieces. You know, it's kind of like David Barrow talking about the dominoes, you know, and you lay them all out in different areas. So, okay, so now for reassembly, draw the track plan as close as you can, making sure you use the measurements of all the modules so it really is important to get the connections as close as you can you know will this module work better with that module and that sort of thing um, all the rooms i've had have been different shapes and sizes which is coming up here next i ran the new bus wires um, i rolled up the signal cables um, sometimes you can use them sometimes you can't but it's not like you can just cut all the cables at every module and expect to reconnect them I ended up tossing, I, I moved 58 modules from Seattle down here. I tossed probably 15 of them. And they were ones that just weren't significant modules. They had track on them and I had to you know, scrape it off. I just threw them away and just built a new module because I got to where I could build a module in 20 minutes. And you know, scraping all that stuff off was just way too much time. Because you'll notice, I, I, I think of speed. I think it's really important to make good progress. So, um, so these are four of the five layouts and I wanted to show them side by side. You can see the room dimensions at the bottom and the very first one there, that's the one that got cut up and made into this double deck kind of inspired by Jim. And then when we moved <clears throat> the second one, that's the first one in Seattle. I was able to do three aisles about three and a half feet wide. And it was a little tight. Um, I had two really big guys that weren't allowed to both be in the same aisle at the same time for fear of having to take the layout out to get them out um, and floor load issues and stuff like that because it was upstairs. Then this third one, um, can you see the cursor or no? No, probably not. That's okay. Um, the third one over there, the Feather River Out 4, that was in a house we built, that was over the garage as well. And there you can see, I switched the, the peninsulas around, but the same elements, these are the upper levels of all of them. And you'll see, for instance, Williams Loop at the end of each one of those. Then the Keddy Y is in one of the corners of each one of those, but they're in different locations, different sequence. So it really helps to have all of these different pieces and put them together. Um, I change, you know, the name of one of the modules to some other name just because of where it ended up in the in the sequence. So here's where it all began, 1993. I can't believe that's what 30 years ago. Anyway, there's that's what I was building when I had to give up a room for my son, and it's only 12 by 14. And it just didn't have any purpose. So it had a loop there on the right. It wound around that higher track on the middle is a branch line to, I don't know, coal mine or something. I thought that was kind of cool. And you could see by having that and then seeing something like Jim's is like, whoa, I got I got to change gears here. So this is where I cut it up and you'll see some of them 
got moved up, some got down, uh, moved down, and then I just connected all the, the bits and pieces. And it's at that time that I decided I really like this Feather River route. It's the old Western Pacific, it ran right near my house, and um, I could go out and rail fan it and take notes. And those are the days of when you got your pictures printed at the 24 hour print place. And I went in a couple of times and the guy goes, hey, I'm sorry, is something wrong maybe with your camera? I got all these pictures of like dirt and railroad tracks and culverts and all this other stuff. And I said, no, just give me the pictures and move out. <laughs> um, so here you can see sort of that second level coming in. And uh, I was excited, you know, it was, uh, you could tell it was something that you had a vision for rather than I had just been building something that meandered around. And I'm sure I would have got very tired of that. Um, use thin lumber for the top. Uh, it's, and at this point, I wasn't really thinking of moving it. Um, so I didn't really do the module idea. And you know, I was putting them up, being careful not to damage the bottom level. And of course, I had just done sawing the bottom level in half, you know. Um, then I, the, the helix was my answer to get between the two. I had a closet that I could use. So there's the helix. Um, it's a necessary evil in this particular case. It's a ton of work, ton of track. It's, it survived the, the move, and then it's by, by the fourth version of the layout, I sold it. You know, I'm just like, I can't do this anymore. Try, you know, trains are disappearing and falling off. And anyway, um, so there you can see kind of uh, what ended up happening. And this is kind of the blueprint for all the other layouts where you have a center peninsula, the Williams Loop is in the, kind of the front, and then yards, staging yards on the right hand side in this case. And then a, I'm sort of at the inside the helix taking these pictures. But so you can see that's kind of starting to be the blueprint. And then that's when. Um, Alicia decided or accepted a job to move to Seattle. So I cut it up as much as I could. It wasn't in very usable pieces. It was kind of all these weird, I was trying to find the picture when it was in the moving van because it was just like a yard sale of bits and pieces and the movers going, I don't know what this is, it's weird. So, so anyways, the first time we rented a house and I started building this little module of, um, I call it little Clio Plyo Trust. And my point is you don't really need to lay out to get started, right? When you build modules, you have a master plan, but you can start building whatever you want. In this case, just a bridge module. I have that date recorded because I started a photo album. And these are two of my friends. We ripped plywood into um, one by twos and one by fours. and I bring it up because 25, 27 years later, that wood is rock solid. It hasn't warped or chipped or anything. And you'll see the journey it's taken during that time. So it's been very stable and you need to build your bench work to be moved. It needs to be sturdy. And you know when people are moving it around, it can't twist. So uh, a 3 8 inch plywood backdrop on each one kept it kind of stable so just be thinking of that when you build these things and here you can see i made i just literally nailed some jig to the floor and started building them and i did all of them in one weekend except for the end caps and down there on the floor you can see that those are a couple of them just lying there uh, four cross members and the edges and, you know, we just, <laughs> excuse me, we just uh, got them up very quickly. And it was nice because we could start laying track very quickly. Mentioned the kind of web type scenery. You could do the foam as well. I just found that when I was reconnecting modules in a different order, I could literally push down the, the scenery if I had to and, and smooth it between the two. So a little bit of an interruption. Uh, we had to move out of our house, but not into the new one. And so I rented a 
storage unit and it had to have wood and I literally put them all back up in a like <laughs> a uh, you know they were all hanging on the wall like it was a layout I did consider trying to figure out how to do a layout in there but it I don't think like, uh, <laughs> the owners would have wondered what was going on in there but um, but it wasn't it was in Seattle but, you know temperatures were hot and cold so again it all survived you know, some pretty extreme moves. So then we rented a house for a couple of years in Redmond and that room was a 20 by 15 kind of bonus room. And again, my son got in the way because he, he was gonna go to college and I wanted to build the railroad. And uh, I was literally measuring the room while he was doing his homework and he looked he looked around and he goes, what are you doing? And I go, no, don't mind me. You know, and I'm literally measuring the room, you know, so I could start on the track plan. Um, here you can see that uh, the little Clio trestle is now in a different order. The two modules on either side are completely different than the ones that were in the uh, former layout. Okay, so now we move into uh, February, Feather River Route 4. This is a room over the garage in a house we built, and I had no money left. Nobody's ever gone over budget on a remodel or a house build project, right? Right? Never, right? And so uh, so that's what it was, and I, I bring it up because at least I had a layout to put back together. You know, it was, I couldn't put anything on the, the ceiling or you know, anything, but I was able to put it back together and yeah, we had fun. It was, um, Seattle doesn't get hot very often, but when it did, I didn't have any AC or anything in there. And uh, sure enough, when it got to like 85 degrees, ooh, um, all the track was, not all of it, but there were definitely buckled track and everything like that. So, and all these things are, you know, adding up to, okay, next layout, build the room first, right? And then here, this was kind of the first time I'd really reassembled it, uh, you know, permanently. And so learned a bunch of things about blending scenery. And you see on the lower picture, that was the end of a rock mold. And then I learned to kind of blend the rocks together for a new module. And then coloring it can be a little bit weird too, because that first, the older stuff is sort of faded a little bit from the, you know, from the lights and everything else. Here's a, that clean cut from the multi-tool, you know, putting it back together with track that crosses the gap. And the reason I say it's a rookie version is you're supposed to fill that gap, then put the track on top. So it must have been one of my crew guys that did that. I would never, I would never do that. Um, important to look at the track work and, you know, if you're reassembling these in a different order, you know, get the main line looking like it was there originally. Um, I even turned a couple of modules around, so the back was now the front, just because it, it worked better. And um, the thing when you join these modules that I learned, it's tough to get perfectly flat, so that you create a vertical curve if you don't get them quite flat. And you can, you know, sand it down and do all that stuff, and that's where I started my dislike of homosote. It just, you know, now anybody bought homosote lately, it's terrible. You know, the thicknesses are all, pardon me? It's expensive, hard to find. The thicknesses are all over the place. So remember, this is N scale. So, you know, a 16th of an inch is a foot, scale foot. So, um, but I use the opportunity. You can see further down in that picture, I was able to expand the yard, which was nice. So. You know, it does give you that opportunity to fix or improve the stuff from the previous layout. I really tried to save any any sections that I had put a lot of effort into. So I probably wouldn't have built the yard ladder that way for this, but I was, you know, I got a lot of layout to build, so I'll just use this one for now. Which we all know how that is, right? The temporary ones that ten years later they're still they're still there. Yeah. And then uh, a lot of a lot of the new modules are are what you're going to need to get 
the, the flow of the trap uh, track and everything else right the scenery whatever but it's really good because instead of you know instead of using every single module it's not gonna you're not gonna ever get all all of them in the you know a different configuration so you know really think step back and think about what it would have looked like if you had built it from the, from the beginning and fill in with those different things the one here on the right is the new Clio trestle not the little one so I'll show you that in a minute and what I also point out here is being mindful of being able to see the back of the lower level so this is a yard and if I had brought that top one fully out to the 15 or 18 inches you wouldn't have been able to see the back back of the yard to work it I show this this is <laughs> I keep looking at this picture and you know we had we, I didn't have anything on the walls you're just uh, you know fiberglass so only four of my crew died but it's no big deal um, the arrows are pointing to kind of the hollow ends of the shell scenery the, the, and that gives you an idea of like okay this module in the front left that that slope has to be completely manufactured again and, and tied together, but it's doable. And uh, I, you'll see in the new on the new layout, a lot of those modules look familiar, and they were they were uh, blended together. So um, the absolute most critical thing is the railhead. So when you build a layout from the start, from the floor up, you end at the railhead. When you start putting it back together you have to get the railhead right. And so then you're maneuvering it to get the X, Y, and Z axes correct. Then in like a yard where I added that middle piece, you have to get the track perfectly lined up all the way through there. So I actually had a, a machine shop make that aluminum for me and fits right between the, the rails. And I use it all the time for laying the new track, but this was essential to get, to avoid a big, kink in the middle of that yard <clears throat> so that is the number one thing i think that's hard to do is getting a big bulky module to sit right even though you're using a, a cross piece across the gap it's got to be really really close to to being right and again end scale very unforgiving okay so pre-finish any of the areas that are in hard to reach areas and then Make mounting them kind of sound like fun to your least favorite crew member. <clears throat> you get you get them to get on a step stool, you know, on a on a <laughs> ladder, and you're calling your insurance agent about liability insurance and things like that. But here's an example of the cut. So Alicia found out that we were moving to Atlanta. She took a, a very good job uh, down here. So only after a year and a half, uh, we were, I was at it again. And again, this is the uh, tool. Uh, you can see modules 41 and 42 there. That's all going into what I was a manual database, but a spreadsheet. And really consider where those cuts are gonna be. And here's the rail getting cut with a Dremel and then just pry it up and throw the, that piece away. Don't try to save any of that. And you don't even know what module that's going to connect to anyway so another time i have to follow my wife and uh i ended up choosing to follow my wife so um but my crew was not happy this is the fourth you know the fifth move really and um, so i said all right i'll take some money from the house sale and i'll fly you guys out to atlanta we can do some barbecue and then do some layout tours and then really I just wanted them to come out and reassemble the layout again. Um, but it, but it is, you definitely, under, you definitely realize how much stuff you have when you go to move it. You know, we all have shelves of, I know you guys have shelves of blue box kits or scale structure kits or whatever, right? Okay, and then that's how it started to look as we disassembled it. Again, the, the sub bench work um, all came apart, it was all screwed together. Uh, but there's a there's sort of a management to this whole thing. Um, I needed the room to build two more bedrooms and a bath so that I could sell the house as a five bedroom house. And, um, you know, it cost me about 80,000 to, to 
finish the room, but we got 200,000 in value on the house. So that was a no brainer, but it created a, a gap or a, a place where I needed to get the layout out of there before we were going to ship it to Atlanta. So I had an out uh, building and I put these, you can see all the modules here and they were all, you know, sitting there and obviously you have to keep it somewhat weatherproof and that sort of thing. So, and then they allowed, uh, the company moving us allowed us to create 10 of the modules. Um, there's a little Clio trestle, Clio trestle again. You can see what I've done is added another six inches to the top of it. So it's still going and it's getting its uh, new look with every move. Here, here's a um, just a, a simple list, but I think it's really important to number the modules, put a little description, get the dimensions, and your movers are going to, if, if you're using a moving company, but also you'll need it when you do your track plan. It's really, really helpful to have exactly all the dimensions, and you know, you'll probably remember where the track configuration was, but um, and then you can, you know, choose the modules like. I chose the ones with the bridges, uh, you know, the more delicate stuff. Mover built them. Yeah. Yeah, this is the company paid for all this. So, And so here I've got these ready, ready to go. Um, so when they got to Atlanta, it looks, my mover used to work I think for the Samsonite company, you know, they, the old ads where they used to throw it around. So they, they just have no idea how fragile this stuff is. So here's what it looked like. Um, the top picture is looking into one of the boxes. Um, yeah, just all thrown in there. And then on the right is the Keddy Y crate. And you think, great, it's all, uh, you know, protected. Not so much if they turn it on its side and ignore the sticker that says up. So now the sticker was going like this, up. And I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding. You can see the track on the left was, you know, torn off. It was bad. And so there's what the Keddy Y looked like. And uh, it, it was not good. I ended up, you know, at, getting some money out of them for done it. It's like, they go, okay, well, how much was it to fix the bridge? I'm like, I don't, you know, <laughs> I have to, yeah. Yeah, there were all sorts of comical, you know, the adjusters like going, it says here you need to replace a bridge. I go, yeah, actually two of them. And you're like, well, you know, so I just, I had some fun with that, you know, these guys. I said, well, it's, it's part of a railroad. He goes, a railroad? Yeah, exactly. We don't move railroads. Oh, you did. Did a, did a crappy job of it too. Yeah. Um, so again, you, you've got these modules that aren't going into a layout necessarily. So you really have to have some room, excuse, to kind of put them, you know, stage them in a way. I was fortunate to have part of the, the basement I wasn't going to use for the layout. I know that's scary for everybody, right? Why would you do that? Um, and so it really helped to have a place to put them. Um, you know, it was temperate in the basement, so you don't have to worry about that. And I learned, finish the basement. So the left is, that's what the basement looked like when I moved in. That was a, couple, well, a month and a half later, I had it all done. And then that's what we did in the last one, which was not good. You're leaning over the layout, you're, who knows what's up there. Um, fiberglass, you know, falling down on the layout. Yeah, it was not good. Um, so then we're starting the reassembly. So we're taking what you've done the track plan and there is a nice period while you're moving to be drawing the track plan and, you know, try to figure out what you want to do when you get the chance. And so I was, you know, these are what I had drawn on paper, but I don't know, maybe there was a better way to, to do them all. So it was kind of nice to have it open, put them down. Okay. That looks good. Let's try it over here. And, um, <clears throat> That's where I started throwing away some modules that just weren't worth trying to fix. Uh, there you can see um, one of the crates. And getting back to paying for some plane tickets, um, five guys took me up on that. And so they flew out 
and uh, it was great. We had a great time, and it was we did go to some layouts, uh, enjoyed it. Um, I had drawn some sketches to kind of visualize where these these pieces might go together and what it might look like. Um, here's my friend Joe. We got started. The thing is, you got to start at one end, and I would say pick where the key uh, modules might have to go and, and work from there, but generally go in sequence. Uh, it's really hard to get it to line up if you start at this end and start at this end and try to meet in the middle without having some, you know, overall uh, ups and downs where you don't need them. Again, I'm big on vertical curves. That's a big. Um, so the modules are bulky. So you, you're going to need a few people anyway. And what we found is you kind of need two people, one at each end, and a third person making the micro adjustments. Uh, we were using these kind of sticks on the outside to just kind of level it up. And again, you can't have enough levels. You're measuring the long way, the crossways, the up and down. It was, you know, like I said, it was a lot more work than, than we had thought. And you're trying to get the railheads right. So that's the big, that's the big uh, guiding factor. So when you have your crew, Make sure the guy you don't like is sitting under a very sketchy, temporary held module uh, in case you need a, you know, a, a better guy later. So, the, so that was, that did, I, I'm a product manager by, by profession. So it made a lot of sense to me that even before these guys got there, and I know them pretty well, you know, have, have the tasks allocated so that you can make some good progress on, on, uh, and putting this back together because once they left it's like well, okay now i got to get somebody else to to do it there you can see kind of taking place uh, we just use instead of straight legs we we put them back to the the base uh, kind of a cleaner look but there you get an idea of kind of the franken layout where it's all sorts of different pieces and, um, but again if the modules are connected right and generally very flat. You can worry about all the track work and scenery. Um, so there's where we ended up after four and a half days of actual work and uh, three days of screwing around. And so we made really good progress. And I think one of the benefits of modules is you kind of see a lot of progress quickly and uh, gets, you know, it's encouraging, especially after you've gone through the headache of moving it and dealing with moving companies and all that stuff. So once we started on the second level, way down in the corner is the Kitty Y module. And the reason I started there was the distance underneath that module down to the, the lower level kind of had to be at least, I wanted it about nine inches. <clears throat> and so that was kind of my top point. And then it came all the way down to down here on the left. So that was the grade, whatever it was going to be. And it works out to, I don't know, 2.4 or something like that. The real railroad only has a 1% grade. but that was critical to get that in the right spot. I don't really like um, hidden tracks, so I really wanted everything kind of out in the open. Um, I used plywood gussets to support the, the upper level. I found that just screwing uh, wood into the studs, there was a little play in the, the, the screws, and it just had enough play that it just wasn't stable enough, but once you put a, like a gusset on there, it was rock solid. So that was key. Um, <clears throat> here's what I was talking about, that minimum clearance under the Keddy Y. And then here was, see if you notice the upper front uh, module is not connected yet to down to the Keddy Y, but that's where I had to have that, that's the Williams loop that had to be at that elevation and everything else. So um, we had to put that in first and then run all the way down. But there's a long way there to, to get it right. And by we had both main lines up and down running in nine months. So that, again, is, and that's all we did is put the modules in and run the main line. So we didn't do anything with the scenery or fascia or anything and honestly you burn out you know you just 
do all bench work. You're like, I never want to do bench work again. And then you do all track and you're like, I never want to do track again. So it is, you got to be kind of brutally disciplined to do that. And I did get to the point as I look at this, it's like, I was so tired of looking at just this mess that I put all this work into and it just looked terrible. And it was just starting to drive me crazy. So I, I did start to put things, you know, put some fascia around and paint it and start to do some cosmetics. But I think it's really important to get the trains running as quickly as you can, just to see some, some reward for all the work you're doing. Um, I put this in because it's not just the layout. If you can do modules for your electronics or anything you can modularize. And now you're probably going to have to do all the, you know, different connections, uh, but at least it's some way to keep track of all these devices. Do not do a joint under a bridge. Uh, learn that the hard way. And it just, I could never get it to line up. Even though the module was pretty close, it just is too finicky and end scale to get that. So I had to rebuild the bridge and uh, it's, anyways. Then uh, you're gonna have situations where the scenery is really far off. It's really gonna look weird if you try to match things up. Um, and then when you're doing all this work, like the, the North Fork Ridge mod, model there, I didn't wanna have something bump it. Because we were, as you'll see, we were messing around. On the right there, the back of that module, that you can see the plywood, is way too high to match the, the one on the other side, right? So we decided we were going to lop off a little bit, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And um, if anyone, anyone been to Yosemite? Uh, ever heard of El Capitan? This is El Decapitan. And we decapitated it and uh, ended up uh, signing the pieces that had come off. And you'll see closely, I've got plan A on there, plan B, plan C, and plan D. And we all signed it and dated it. And here I am with the Sawzall cutting the top of it off. And uh, below me is, believe it or not, little Clio Trestle, still going strong. And so, uh, Again, this end module, I had a module for it. It got damaged, and this is a critical grade that has to be just right. And I was like, throw that thing away and just build a new one. I'm so happy I did, because we haven't had any, any trouble with the track work on that side. I built the first level up to the point there that you see on the right, again, to run trains and have a passing siding, and just, just to see something running. So I would recommend doing that get trains running and pick a spot where you can go to and then uh, run around and have some fun with it a little bit. Here I'm starting to cover up some of the edges, put some backdrop up and it's a little, little more of the cosmetic stuff once you kind of have the, the guts of the bench work back together. And uh, just a, a long shot of the room. I think it's good to sort of stop purposely and kind of, you've been going like crazy, moving, reassembling, guys are coming over, whatever, to stop and just kind of say, okay, is this, is this going the direction I really want to go? And what's my plan going forward? 53 feet. There was a wall when we moved in from that earlier picture and I, I took it out. I hope it doesn't fall. There's a, there's a fireplace above it too. And there was a lot of creaking when I took the wall out. No, I put, I put, yeah, no, I put two L LBLs in there, so it's it's fine. But I wanted it to be clear all the way down because I really like that long, you know, with N scale, we run 10 foot trains, 25 car trains. So it looks nice when you're looking down and you see the train snaking through. So I didn't want it to have to go all, you know, zigzagging around. So um, those two guys, Kent and Dave, were the same guys that were cutting the wood for my second version 20 years before this picture. So um, you gotta have you gotta have friends and be amazed how many of the crew get involved in the layout. You know, it's sort of our baby together that we we built. And I created these train weeks for these guys to come down and we would work on the layout, we'd go 
rail fanning. We'd see some layouts. We'd go have a few beers. I even made some commemorative cars one year. We had, I made t-shirts. So we, I had fun, you know, it was just more than just, oh, come down and do work. We, um, I just felt like I didn't want to abandon that crew. They, they had helped me get those first layouts going. I just wanted them to continue to be a part of it. And I have a great crew here too. So uh, I'm blessed to have all that. So that's what it looks like today. Um, a lot different than the Franken layout that you saw before. Um, it's uh, as far, it's farther than I've ever gone on a layout. And thanks to being able to, yeah, you, you kind of build and then you go back to reassemble it. You build, then you go back to reassemble it. But here it is in its current form. We have lots of op sessions and uh, thanks to our friend, Mr. Hemingway, we have some lots of electronics. Um, some of them are actually finished. And then um, little Clio trestle, four layouts, five moves, 28 years and counting. So it can be done um, and it just becomes, <laughs> kind of has a life of its own, I think. There's the new Clio trestle, which is more accurate. The real one has 10 towers and I had room for it. So if you remember the one module that I had built in that other picture, a new module, this is where it was. It's, it's actually the most expensive bridge because <clears throat> when I worked for Honeywell, everyone had to take a week of furlough without pay, but you couldn't work, you couldn't even log in. So I forgave a week's salary to build that bridge. So that's a lot of money you know, for a bridge, so. Okay, so big question, does it really speed things up? Here's the latest layout, here's the, what happens. We started on July 23rd of 16. In five months, we had the first trains on the lower level. In nine months, we had both levels running. Um, 14 months later, I had the first off session and 27 months later, uh, we had the whole Dixie Rail crowd come in and operate. So I do have a YouTube channel that I was using to tell all my guys back home the progress on the layout. So if anyone has trouble sleeping, it's a great solution for that. And the lessons I've learned that I want to pass along to y'all, um, your layout will eventually have to be dismantled. You just, it's going to be. Um, the standardized modules, I think, is the way to go. Uh, they can be rearranged. They can come in and out of the rooms, things like that. Uh, the generic sections can be, you know, if you do track arrangements that can be called anything, you know, it's a passing siding and some spurs, you know, why not? They can be changed to a whole bunch of things and be more flexible when you put it back together. Um, toss those unfinished sections that are gonna to take too long. You wanna keep some momentum. Um, you'll get good at blending the scenery. And if not, you just tear it out and, and keep trying. And it, it can make it look good if you think through making it look like it was original and not, I piece these things together. I looked at, look back at these changes as a way to change things. I didn't really change much in the way of era or scale, but you certainly could. I have one friend I mentioned here, he built an HO layout. When he reassembled it, he went to N on the same roadbed of the HO. And so he had nice broad turns and it just really made the layout expand. <clears throat> um, again, it's harder, it's harder to get everything right than just starting fresh. And then, like I said, don't burden your heirs. I literally have allocated funds when I go to have my friends take care of all of it so my wife doesn't have to deal with it. So as it turns out, you don't have to be Einstein. Um, I love this picture of his math equations and everything on the, on the board. And so design the track arrangements if you, if you have it in mind that they could be used differently. Um, design it for what you wanna do more of. Actually a reassembly of modules could let you avoid some of the stuff you don't want to do. You don't have to do it twice, right? And then reusing the modules may save you some time, some money, like it did on that uh, fourth version for me when I ran out of money building the house. And then get help. A lot of guys love to help, see the, get invested in it. And then the crew lounge, I, I learned that that's a, that's a, a have to have. And then of course, pizza and beer, but after the work sessions, so.
And then, okay, where does that bring me? What have I learned for me? Um, so we're, we bought some property in Cherokee County. We're going to be building a house over the next year. I know, I, I'm cursed with moving layouts, but um, this time I'm not going to reassemble this one. I think I, I, this one's run its course because I have a lot more room in the basement and I want to do an HO layout uh, with double, double main and then branch lines coming off of that. I'm going to pay the framers to do the bench work this time and walls and lighting. I just like, I don't want to deal with that anymore. And then uh, I can apply all these learnings on a fresh layout, you know, my skill level, my, um, you know, everything I've learned over the years, I can start fresh with a new layout. So, so that's my plan. And uh, I want to thank you for paying attention, staying awake. Uh, do we, I can take questions. Yeah, if anybody having some questions. I'm off of East Cherokee and Avery. Are you up that way? Oh, good. Great. Want to want to help? Want to help on a layout? So the question was. Is there some magic to the six foot module? No, no, standardized because you've got a doorway to go out of or you've got stairs to go down, that's your limiting factor. And then replicating the same thing, you can always put two six foot modules together for a 12 foot, right? But it was just a way to do that quickly, get them all up, and then, you know, you can figure out. There, there were definitely like those end cap modules. Um, they were going to be sort of customized, but even they had to go out of the room too. So, and it's a little easier in end scale. A, a turnaround like that is four feet. You know, HO, you got an eight foot piece to try to get out the door. So, that's a good question. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? So three was in the rental house, um, and it was it was that's the room that uh, I was measuring when my son was annoyingly still there doing his homework. Um, so <laughs> so that only that was about a two year you know thing. It was a, we rented the house, so it, we weren't you know. We ended up building that other, the new house. And so it was the same kind of thing. You know, it was reassembled in different order. I still had the helix. So I was the last one with the helix. Yes, there was. The question was, where, where was number three? There was a third one, only about two years. It was reassembled. It was kind of the, the same kind of thing. So I wanted to move on to four because there was a lot more to show that would be relative to you guys. Everybody's all, I do, I do. Yeah, hopefully she's not moving again, you know. We're, I know, that's what, sometimes, yeah, yeah, but I can change light bulbs and fix things, so she keeps me around, you know. All right, thanks, you guys. Thanks, Mark, that was really good. Um. Well, yeah, okay, we're, we're fine. Now, uh, let's see, we have to go through a little bit of machinations here too. Yeah, I, I agree, especially Mark's thing about having the builders put in stuff in our basement. I had them put in a lot of wafer LED lights. The electrician was saying, that's a lot of lights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, never enough. And um, yeah, it was absolutely worth doing it. However, I found that LEDs don't, when you have a bunch of LED lights, dimmers don't like them. Dimmers and the circuit breakers don't work well. So I just have it on off. I don't care anyway. It's plenty of light. Anyway, um, any more announcements or anything? We're good then. So next month. We'll have Gordy here. Please come make a good showing. 
listen to a bit of Scottish accent, ask him about things like haggis and good beer and other things like that. Maybe you'll <laughs> maybe you'll be able to pontificate a little. And um, uh, um, for next month, bring a good bring something to show off for Gordy, so he'll just go, "Wow, these guys are good." No theme. Bring a good model. You know, the theme is something that's really good. Something to, something to blow them away. Yeah, in, 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 you know, just a little, you know, variety pack here. Okay, good deal. Hey, drive safely. Uh, there's no baseball game tonight. So uh, people going that way are good. I don't know what the construction's doing the other way, but anyway. And uh, see y'all next month.